Welcome, Paul. Hi there, I'm Paul Steckley. In my day job, I'm the president of Applied Electronics. Uh, I've spent uh, 10 years on the um, main SIMPTE board and eight years on the one that you're all uh, sitting as uh, guests of today, so I highly advocate uh, membership in SIMPTE. So this was either my 20th or 21st IBC. I can't really remember, but then again, it is Amsterdam, so. Uh, um, um, but nevertheless, uh, it's uh, a show that a lot of people speak very, very highly of. Um, the IBC is owned by six not-for-profit uh, entities. So one of those is uh, SIMPTE, owning 11% of IBC. Uh, the BTS is a division, a European division of the IEEE, uh, uh, Institution of Engineering uh, Technology, the International Association of Broadcast Manufacturers. Uh, I've now been elected to that board uh, in my spare time. Uh, the Royal Television Society and the Society of uh, Cable Television Engineers. They all own varying, per varying percentages of them, and they are all not-for-profits. So uh, general impressions, attendance actually fell this year. So it breaks a 10-year stretch. Uh, it went from 55,884 uh, to 57,000, or it went down to 55,884 from 57,699. Uh, so there was a 10-year succession of uh, where the attendance had actually grown, even though in some of those years it was uh, um, barely by a, a, a few hundred. Um, overwhelming opinion that most North American attendees stayed home this year. It was evident both on the manufacturing side and in the customer base. Everybody just felt a lot less North Americans came over. Uh, the show floor was still sold out. Um, and after 20 years, it's still a really hard venue to navigate. Uh, basically, the convention center has been built up over the years in a lot of different uh, buildings that have all been attached. Uh, they've consumed all the aisle space and all the hallway space to make more exhibit space. And after 20 some odd years, we all still get lost uh, trying to find a way around IBC. Fortunately, most of the vendors have an uncanny uh, uh, practice of showing up in the same booth every year. So you tend to find, uh, uh, find them where you saw them the year before. 8K, so over in the future zone, uh, we kind of, kind of, the show kind of heralded in uh, the new uh, era of 8K. Um, there was a fair bit of hype around the NHK 8K launch. Um, the default frame rate is set at 919.88 uh, frames. So even though we've gone to this uh, great new uh, high res standard, we still can't get rid of fractional frame rates uh, after all these years. Um, the soccer game clip they were showing in a, in a make-believe living room was actually very, very hard to watch. Um, one of the things that we all started to learn as the first test reels of UHD1, uh, sometimes misspoken uh, as 4K, uh, in higher dynamic range, uh, we, we, you can really see the effect of spatial resolution uh, going up uh, as creating motion blur. And in fact, a lot of people thought that the motion blur, uh, even at 120 frames, was actually very, very bad. Um, Sony demonstrating uh, switching of a, a, one of the best demonstrations I saw of 8K was Sony switching from 120 to 60 frames, uh, ca ca causing the arm of a slow moving metronome to basically disappear. So if you've seen some of the 4K that's been launched in Canadian television, for example, next to HD, I noticed things like the shaft of a golf club when simulcast with, with HD, uh, the shaft of a golf club disappearing and other motion blur artifacts. But it's just one of the things that we could never uh, really have anticipated until we actually started to show the, uh, the tests. Um, hearing more and more industry buzz about the practicalities of 1080p60. 1080p60 is something we can do here. Now it looks fabulous. It looks better than any 8K and or so-called 4K uh, demonstration that I've, I've seen yet. So a lot of people are in the industry are talking about uh, um, why don't we just go to 1080p60 and uh, um, in the meantime. So again, that 8K was shown in what's called the future zone. Uh, I always find a few kind of uh, comical things in the future zone. Um, obviously, the 8K uh, was the, uh, the big feature. And they, again, you could walk over to this NHK exhibit uh, in its usual place year after year, and you could see a simulated uh, living room soccer game with 8K. And again, most people found it uh, not very pleasant, pleasant to look at. Uh, this is uh, a new group called the Ultra HD Forum. Um, all the different companies that are uh, participating in this new uh, uh, endeavor to uh, Ultra HD. And this was the, uh, the, the screen that everybody was uh, watching. And um, 
a lot of people notice, for example, the advertising on the uh, sides of the stadium seem to disappear and blur, especially things in the busy crowd. Uh, when they follow the action with the soccer ball, a lot of people really uh, notice the, uh, the motion blur. This is the 22.2 multi-channel sound system. Uh, SMPTE has started an immersive audio group, uh, something a little bit different for SMPTE. And um, uh, I must say that, that of all the things I have seen around uh, higher UHD resolutions, uh, some of the audio demonstrations are very, very impressive in terms of the way they can position the audio so that uh, uh, something in the action that sounds like it's behind you does, in fact, sound like it's behind you. And again, more uh, shots of the, uh, um, the blurry. Uh, actually, at CES this year, um, it was the third year in a row that most of the 8K demonstrations did not show any moving pictures. And the ones that tried uh, really, again, showed up this whole issue of motion blur. And not quite sure what the solution is and why we would be racing uh, to that. Uh, I have a running joke when I give my uh, own presentations. I say, if they're going to show the Olympics in 8K, we'll just go tell the athletes to slow down. Just don't go fast. And you won't see the motion blur. Um, so this was the Sony exhibit of, 8, of 8K. And um, this is the famous metronome. Uh, they, I don't know where, what frequency that amount of, uh, of, of elevation in the weight would give you. But it was a very modestly moving. And they would literally switch the, uh, um, the picture back between 120 and 60 frames. And the arm on the metronome disappeared completely when you uh, switch it down to a mere 60 frames uh, progressive. Uh, this is again back to the future zone. Uh, this was a, uh, I don't know why this was getting such a crowd. This was a drone that had a sphere, and the sphere was illuminated with LEDs. So as the drone flew around, it would uh, light up and show various uh, things. And uh, again, like most of the uh, cute tricks in that uh, future zone, it uh, got a lot of attention. Uh, a virtual reality space again in the future zone. Uh, some technology highlights. Um, so I was just having a contretemps with uh, Lee Whitcomb, uh, who was correcting me on a, a few different things. Uh, to be honest, I, I felt uh, rather disappointed in the uh, progress of the IP standards. Uh, the interop didn't really look any different uh, from last year's IBC, and most people thought it didn't look much different than it did uh, in NAB as well. Um, uh, there is, again, going back to my uh, time on the SIMPTE board, um, there is a little bit of an elephant in the room when it comes to the work being done in the AMWA, uh, which is not a standards organization uh, in SIMPTE. Um, throughout the show, I heard constant references to AMWA standards and uh, when AMWA standards would be adopted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there seems to be a great deal of confusion, uh, and AMWA is not a standards organization and does not issue standards. So they would presumably give recommendations back to groups like SIMPTE uh, to be created as proper uh, standards. Um, I found also the, the communication out of AMWA on the progress of, uh, and things like target release dates. I actually thought that was quite poor. Um, the control aspects uh, that AMWA is doing, the auto discovery, uh, network control, um, so-called northbound APIs, um, are really quite essential in terms of actually launching and using um, IP. So, um, uh, yeah, so while the JTNM chart uh, showed significant new threads, the interop itself changed little since last year. And a lot of the IP devices that are shown and discussed as IP devices are actually SDI cores. Things like switchers are SDI cores with converters uh, on the in and the outside. So while it was my opinion that I was rather disappointed with some of the progress of uh, IP and uh, new introductions of IP equipment, I also heard it from the uh, customers that were over there as well. Uh, this is going down to the uh, uh, IP showcase. Uh, it was actually easier to find this year. Maybe we're all getting used to it. Uh, AES, Ames, European Broadcast Union, uh, the Video Services Forum, AMWA, and SIMPTE were the, uh, the main uh, sponsors for the uh, interop. And this is the famous uh, JTNM chart uh, showing uh, we now have an ISO 7, and I believe there's even an ISO 8 uh, Lee, in, the, in the works. It's not already up to uh, ISO 8. Um, so the 2110 uh, standard itself is uh, seen as relatively mature. Um, and I'm trying to see if there's anything else there that would, uh, um, talking about uh, content model and APIs, uh, security recommendations, uh, timing and identity, 
and uh, ISO 7, obviously a new uh, venture in terms of e event and tally. Just the other end of the uh, JTM chart. Uh, they try to issue this chart uh, at least twice a year at NEB and IBC. And originally, I think the goal was to try to introduce it three times. But so again, most of the same things that were at NEB uh, were uh, at IBC as well. So obviously, the uh, AMWA uh, uh, folks were represented as the ISO five and ISO ISO four, um, showing the uh, those two protocols, whatever you want to call them, uh, uh, actually in operation. Um, not much changed in 2110. Uh, in fact, uh, if Lee can even comment, I don't know whether anything has actually changed at all, uh, really, since. Um, um, I am hearing a lot on the industry side about this wide, narrow bandwidth shaping, um, that not much is actually conforming to narrow, and that the uh, aspect of going in and out of SDI back to IP again uh, drags it down. Uh, Lee was uh, correcting me just before I uh, got up here to speak that uh, Dante is not part of the 2110 standard, so I'm going to go back and try to find all those uh, slide presentations that uh, point to it. Um, but there was a lot of people talking about mixing Dante into 2110, and 2110, uh, of course, runs on the uh, 2059 standard, and uh, Dante is still apparently only working in 1588 V1, and the assumption is that they'll uh, hopefully soon up it to 2059. But um, uh, there's no real clear explanation how that would actually, how 1588 V1 would work with a 2059, and everybody knows the difference in 2059 versus uh, 1588 V2 is 2059 recognizes frame boundaries. So again, I think one of the, the, the parts that I thought worked really well in the interop was the, uh, the link redundancy side. Um, I'm always surprised at how much they can mess up those pictures and have them come out the other side intact. Um, uh, starting to use the words uh, deterministic, uh, words that I've tended to use for a long time in terms of uh, um, uh, the way we have a predictable path of a timing when a packet goes in, determining when the packet's going to come out. And uh, just some of the other uh, booths of the, uh, uh, the interop uh, talking about uh, uh, the inf infrastructures and compatibilities between those infrastructures. And uh, contrary to public, uh, to misperception uh, is that, um, uh, you know, people were talking about when there would be a 2110 standard in 4K or UHD1. Um, and the intent is there doesn't need to be. Uh, the standard is self-describing in its resolution and can uh, accommodate uh, anything up to 35,000 pixels squared. So again, this was the audio section and the video sections of the, uh, of the interop. And as Lee points out, there was about 64 manufacturers involved. And uh, again, but it didn't uh, change a lot since NAB or even since last year. Uh, there was a constant uh, uh, um, list of presenters uh, in a little theater uh, that was also televised on the IBC TV in the interop. Again, just a close-up of the, uh, see one of our sponsors for tonight's equipment there. Um, so this was the, the video portion of the uh, um, interop and the predominantly audio version of the interop. Uh, diversity of exhibitors, uh, we tend to see a lot more service providers like satellite companies. Uh, consumer equipment is more prevalent in IBC. So some of the people that you wouldn't expect to see at an NEB um, are show up at an IBC. I'm still uh, surprised that the one hall that is used for RF and transmission gear is uh, very, very well attended and virtually full. So RF seems to be alive and well uh, in Europe versus the decline we've seen at an NEB. All right, so I'm just going to go just just finish off with some, uh, some picture slides. Um, uh, obviously, AWS starting to uh, offer its cloud offerings and various flavors of, uh, and functionality in its cloud offering. Um, this is one of the satellite providers that's been there year after year. I'm always surprised uh, for all 20 or 21 years that I've been uh, the first booth you walk into, more or less coming in uh, from the main entrance uh, where the cab line uh, drops off is this company that makes uh, TV remotes. So again, something you wouldn't normally see at NAB. Um, yeah, Deluxe, uh, obviously well represented there. I don't think Deluxe shows in NAB. Uh, no, they, they do. 
The IBC different, the, the pace of the show is seen as more relaxed uh, with the longer five day duration. A lot of people um, talk about, you know, NEV is really a three day show and nobody shows up for the fourth day. Um, uh, IBC is just seen as more relaxed, more open, fewer whisper suites. Um, it had starting to get the reputation of showing what's real uh, and deliverable uh, coming out of uh, NEB versus uh, uh, new introductions. Um, mo majority of booths uh, serve beer and wine every day but the last. In fact, it's amazing the prevalence of alcohol uh, intermixed with the rest of the show. Um, so uh, imagine, as usual, uh, these are just random pictures of various uh, booths. Uh, the Imagine uh, was off in their own area. This used to be a restaurant uh, once upon a time in the, in the facility, uh, and it was the Imagine side. Uh, a lot of talk about uh, NAB at IBC, as in who's going and who's not going to NAB. So there's some things gyrating in terms of the trade show world um, and uh, NAB. It'll be kind of interesting as we do the run-up to, uh, to April. Obviously, companies showing IP multi-viewers. Um, obviously, as we go to IP, that really changes the whole multi-viewer paradigm in terms of uh, the connection, the lack of a matrix that you need. Um, some familiar names, Sony, uh, Huawei, who uh, doesn't uh, show much in the States uh, for reasons of various intellectual property issues and whatnot. Uh, it's quite a big presence over in Europe. Uh, this is just one of the, the normal uh, entry halls. Uh, they do segregate the floor. So, for example, all the cameras and support are in one of the halls uh, up these stairs. So they do try to segregate uh, areas of the uh, um, exhibitors based on technology. Some familiar names. Um, this was uh, an actually an interesting product. Um, uh, this is called a, a network-attached processor. So as we get into non-discrete signal paths, and we don't have, we won't necessarily have cards with a goes in and a goes out anymore. Uh, this is a device that hangs off a network and can do what we would do in modular gear, just doing it uh, hanging off a network. Uh, Grass Valley was a bit conspicuous. They moved into the old SAM space. So Grass Valley's uh, uh, one of the main halls. Grass Valley's booth has been there for the 19 or 20 years that I've been going previous. And they were uh, one of the ones that uh, actually moved and moved into what used to be the, uh, the traditional space that Snell held. And they had a HD uh, mobile for, um, uh, for 4K HD. Again, just some of the familiar names, CBS, Dillette, uh, Ravenna, uh, obviously where um, um, AES 67 was derived from the Ravenna Consortium. And this is our IBC partnership booth. Um, all our good friends of Simpty about there. And we thought uh, uh, last year that the, because they were doing some construction, that the venerable beach was gone. And uh, anyways, the beach is back <laughs> at IBC. And they seem to have uh, uh, remained, uh, kept that space that uh, looked like it was going to be overrun by more exhibit space for a while. And again, just one of the bigger halls, Hall 7. Uh, coming down the escalator. And one of the favorite booths is a little uh, vendor that we actually represent. Uh, seem to, uh, I, I, I said, so what are you going to do when you pack that booth up? Are you just going to get out some pins and start popping the balloons? And that's exactly what they did. So. <laughs> and again, just some of the familiar names you see um, uh, at NEB. And, oh yes, in every show now we have to have a dancing robot. So these were two of those welding robots that were having some sort of confrontant. So this is on the, on the uh, I do these pictures on the Tuesday uh, when uh, most of the booths are torn down. So the, whoever supplied them with the cameras had come and got them already. <laughs> so there were empty cameras as these two robots uh, danced and jousted and did all the other funny things. I don't know where in, in the real world you would ever use such a camera support. And again, outside, this was uh, one of the, uh, the famous Hall 14 that was added as a temporary structure and has now become pretty much a permanent part of the, uh, the ride, but again, as the show um, started to grow. The other, other major show that's held there uh, called Integra Integrated Systems Europe in February uh, just announced that they will move it to Barcelona after 2019. I haven't heard anything official yet, but there's more rumbling that IBC could follow um, them to Barcelona. 
And again, um, yes, uh, as if uh, ATSC3 had uh, uh, reared its ugly head in, in, uh, uh, in the United States, still under constant consultation here in, in uh, uh, Canada, but uh, uh, that was the uh, launch uh, with the hybrid solution of DVB3. And that's it. So. Twenty minutes and one second. There you go. <laughs> you said I couldn't get it in twenty minutes. Paul, well, once again, as Thank always, you. do you have these just lined all over the place? I, I, right I had a few of them, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again for uh, for that. Any but I don't have one signed by Lee. I don't think. Oh, there you go. It's a collector's version. Uh, any quick questions for Paul? Perfect. Thanks again okay. for the usual IBC wrap up. We really appreciate that, Thank you. Paul. All right. Uh, I'm going to just kick us off really quickly uh, and talk a little bit about uh, CCAM. Uh, we heard about uh, we heard about SIMTI, and so uh, I see there's quite a bit of CCAM people out here tonight. So we wanted to talk about that, introduce you to CCAM as well, and then we're going to get right into who really matters here, which is the Ontario Legislature and the MLSE, because you don't want to hear us talking about a whole bunch of other stuff uh, really quickly. Um, so. Well, this is about me, doesn't really matter. I'm Kermada Solutions. Um, we're a, a, a consulting company who deals with that. What matters is CCAM around here, which is a, um, a project that we put together a couple of years ago. It's dedicated to the practice of digital asset management um, across really all industries. Today, for example, we have some non-for-profits with us. We have some banks. We get the Royal Ontario Museum and a few others out here. And so what we're really doing is trying to bring together the group of people who are trying to figure out how to manage all of their video as well as all of their images. It's, it's a problem across uh, all industries today. Um, we even know of one non-for-profit that has over 200 terabytes of videos and as they're sitting on hard drives and they're trying to figure out how actually they, you know, what they do with them or, or how they actually get to, to all of that content. Um, like I said, it's the only organization in Canada uh, that's doing this. We're really proud of, of what we're doing here. Um, it's really bringing together people in the DAM, MAM, the PAM. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. The creative asset management. We even deal with rights management, um, the MLIS, uh, as well as archive management. So it brings together a large group of people, all from varying sectors. Um, and then what we do is we offer a variety of really some really great interactive educational community building opportunities. We run conferences. Uh, we have salons, we have some webinars. Our good friends at MLSE have actually agreed to do a, a webinar with us. We're really excited about that. Um, for those who have a little bit of time tomorrow, we actually have a big one on metadata. Uh, metadata being a real key. We got Stephanie Lemieux. We're gonna talk about the most common mistakes when designing schemas tomorrow. So you still have time to sign up for that one. It's online. Um, and then we also have them available afterwards um, around all of that. So we have this uh, quick presentation that we're going to do, but again, we're going to hand it right over to this, which is what is DAM? Um, a lot of people still think it's this, and it was really hard to get any kind of URL with DAM in it, by the way. Uh, it turns out we have a lot of DAM builders in Canada, and I had no idea about that. Um, didn't realize we had so many. I guess it makes sense with all the lakes that we have here. Um, so Wikipedia defines it as you know digital asset management, is really the management of tasks and, and decisions surrounding ingestion, annotation, cataloging, storage, retrieval, and the distribution of, of digital assets. It's, it's really used broadly, digital asset management, which has really caused a mass amount of confusion. I was at a conference in New York in May, and there was 42 vendors all saying that they were damn, and they came from archive and rights, um, actually security, all of these areas. At NEB, there was something like 86 that said that they were uh, digital asset management last year. And we know that there's not 86 dams at NAB. Uh, so we're seeing this used really, really poorly. Um, again, the, what a dam is really about uh, is it came from the print world, uh, mostly. We see a lot of that when it comes to the typesetting and catalog production, really, and then it really grew in advertising. Um, around all of that. The functionality is just like a MAM in terms of the upload management, transformation really of images. 
uh, around all of that. And most of them connect with Adobe, Photoshop, uh, you know, Illustrator, these kind of things. And then finally, the DAM users themselves traditionally used to be advertising, creative agencies, marketing departments, the communication department, right? For example, at a non-for-profit, it would be the DAM owners. But what we're finding is, is that those DAMs can't support video very well. And so what's happening is, is that we're starting to see this real blend into MAM, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, has anybody ever heard of PAM? And I'm not talking about the ladies. Um, but in, term, in this case, we're talking about production asset management, which is a whole other sector that we're starting to see really build up around all of that, um, which is, you know, how do I manage it while it's in production or in flight versus the final assets and the distribution of it? We're seeing this a lot. Um, it's a real growth market in the video game industry specifically. They're really struggling with it. We had an event in Montreal, uh, I guess it was like last month, where we had uh, Ubisoft come and talk all about all of the struggles that they're having you know, with managing the metadata, the images, all the video clips and animation codecs and everything associated with the actual video games themselves. Um, again, it has to do with more fast movement, a lot of review and approval kind of things, um, as well as multiple changes or edits. Um, if, you're, if you're looking for something that you need to uh, catalog things that you need to edit or have multiple revisions, PAMs are really a good thing. We're starting to see PAMs start to sneak in more to MAMs in, in some ways, but hard to tell these days. Uh, finally, what's a MAM, which is why we're here. A MAM has to do with media asset management, obviously. Another subset, primary focus is on media files. So we're really not talking about images at this point, we're talking more about video. Although we are seeing, of course, that MAM systems can cover uh, images with no issues whatsoever. Um, these are usually designed uh, from the ground up to actually be able to deal with video. We've consulted with some DAM providers who thought that they could get into video, and the more that they tried to deal with it, the more they realized that their actual core product just couldn't handle the movement of it and what it really needed to do. Um, so they're actually starting to redesign a lot of the dams from ground up to deal with all of that. Um, when do you use it? Generally, when you're looking for more long-term preservation, those kind of things. All right, enough of me. I don't, you know, we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about two presentations tonight. I'm really excited about this. We have two. One, we have Michael D'Onofrio, the Director of Broadcast and Recording Services from the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. Michael's going to talk about the lessons that he learned um, along with the rest of the team there from kicking off a MAM project um, just last year. Uh, it started and, and they're underway. And then we have David August, the Director of Tra uh, Technology, and Michael McSween, uh, the Manager of Traffic, both of MLSE. Um, they're really going to take us through their MAM journey and transformation along the way. And they have a really interesting story that really goes across, again, all of those types of industries um, that a lot of you are here from today. Um, we were invited to talk um, uh, as a, I guess as a mature MAM, which caught us a little by surprise, but that's apparently what we are now. Um, <laughs> well, it's operating. Yeah, I mean, it's all relative, I suppose. Yeah, yeah it exists. Um, so the, the way we figured we'd tackle it, uh, MAM is, it's, so part of our, our maturity is that we've been around for quite a long time um, in the MAM space. So we broke it up into to two um, phases, as we're calling it. So the first phase was the Mega Master uh, plan to the digital archive. So as you might um, gather from the name Mega Master, we started off with massive plans to do everything under the sun uh, and do it all right away. Um, we, there was a, a, a extended period of buying pieces ad hoc that the vision was to long-term layer them together. Um, and that, uh, as you might imagine, was a difficult, uh, led to a lot of inefficiencies for us um, and forced us to do a little bit of retrenching. Um, David, did you want to speak a little more about yeah, that? Yeah, just to add to, you know, sort of that additional scope, um, you know, as we break down our individual businesses that, that Michael and I spoke about just a second ago, um, you know, we had our linear networks, uh, we had our in arena presentation, uh, we had digital signage, uh, we had, you know, print media, and we were sort of all, each of those were operating prior to, uh, to our MAM project as individual silos and various archiving solutions, and again, uh, you know, similar scenarios, hard disks 
on people's desks, uh, boxes of tapes stored in closets and under people's desks and, you know, wherever you could find them. And really we thought, you know what, like, you know, one ring to rule them all. Like, we're gonna like, we're gonna bring all these outliers in and bring them together. And, you know, we quickly realized that maybe we weren't so friendly with each other and that, uh, you know, one goal wasn't something that was achievable. Um, and so we quickly uh, you know, retreated and, uh, and we started really with our linear networks, and uh, and as our as our sort of slide progresses, we 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 really came down to two things. <laughs> so we went from trying to do everything to doing two things, and, and really that was to actually move to a digital workflow, so, and to eliminate a tape library. That was it. That was that was all we ended up with, and uh, that's uh, we'll expand on that a little bit as we we go forwards. So yeah. So part of that was, um, yeah, along with the, the um, scope change, there was also some changes organizationally. We created a MAM team. That's how I got involved at that point. Um, it hadn't existed until then. It was something that uh, senior leaders were doing off the side of their desk. Uh, and as you might guess, that didn't necessarily go um, speedily because they had full-time jobs to do as well. So it was great for me, um, and I think it, um, Having a, a nice, nicely defined uh, set of parameters to go in with also made my job and the job of my team at that point a lot easier. Um, so digital workflows, that was the first scope. Uh, what we did basically was we uh, defined a delineation. So there was the, um, the digital workflows that were going to require software. So um, it's no secret that the vendor that we wound up with was Dillette. Um, and we didn't have it when we first arrived. It had been chosen, but it was a ways away from being implemented. So what we wanted to do, though, was to look for those uh, early wins and to start establishing a MAM culture, if you will, inside the, the organization. And a lot of that you can do without any software at all. Um, so things like file naming conventions, um, file server retention policies, um, delivery like um, regulations around what our vendors could deliver to us in and also what our own camera people could go out and shoot in. Uh, one of the jokes that we had was our production team has never met a camera or edit suite that they didn't like and want to use. So there was a little bit of wrangling there to get them used to the idea that, yeah, you've got you to gotta make some, some uh, compromises to, to get your value out. And then on the software side, so as, as the software was implemented, we focused on setting up a metadata schema, uh, working on digital shot listing, which is why I've got that little graphic down there. That's the, um, the sports logging tool that we use for logging games. Um, and then we settled in. Um, really, MAM became an archive. So in our first phase, we, we didn't try and, and provide something that was going to sit on top of our editing software. Uh, we really, it was, we edited outside of the archives, or the, the MAM solution, if you will, and then it found its way in. Um, so that allowed us to, uh, to, to build something that was cost effective and also just time effective. And then the other uh, point was eliminating the tape library. So um, you'll, the, the uh, Rebecca Waters, who's in the, the building and would actually be up here speaking if she wasn't um, on maternity leave right now, uh, is largely responsible for all of this. She took over after I moved on to other things. Um, and she might correct my, some of my numbers, but uh, there was a, the tape library across multiple um, locations was about 25,000 uh, tapes that we had to uh, weed through and ingest and describe um, either by importing existing metadata or doing it ourselves. Um, as you can imagine, that was a big task and in some respects it's still ongoing. Uh, the actual ingest is over, but we're still describing things and might be for a while. Um, and then, uh, really, the, the, one of our main check, parts, check marks and one of the, the ways that we got our, um, marked ourselves as having succeeded was stopping purchasing tapes. And that was a big day for us um, on the team. Um, so just to give you, you know, so we talked a little bit about an overview, but just to give you sort of an example of uh, sort of our day-to-day -day workflows. Um, so that you understand some of the sort of grassroots stuff. So we really had two base, two ways of ingesting content. So we had a baseband ingest, uh, but that baseband ingest was being recorded by our master control and then being FTP'd as a file into our MAM. That was our baseband ingest method uh, to start. Um, and our second was file-based. Uh, so those were again coming into workstations, 
uh, digital media coming in from the camera, and the operator would have to then you know, uh, describe or add metadata and then ingest that content off the hard disk uh, into the system. So that was the sort of two data, data way workflows. Um, content coming back out generally required one of our MAM specialists or our librarians to go into the system, search for the content, then export that content, and then that would then be brought into uh, you know, an edit environment uh, for manipulation before being then exported from our editing environment as a new piece of content, but then which go back through our, our file-based ingest. Um, just some, uh, some basic overviews. Our mezzanine codec is XDCAM50. Um, when we started this project, uh, again, back in 2010, we started 2012, we implemented um, or we started implementation, it certainly didn't happen overnight. Um, uh, we were operating on 310 terabytes of usable storage. Uh, we had one LTO5 drive and two LTO4 drives, uh, 100 slots and 450 tapes in our, in our, in our vault. Um, you know, four media workstations, two shot listers, ingest, web clients. Um, so that gives you like sort of a very brief overview of where we started, which like we said, really ended up as, a, as an archiving solution. Um, about uh, 18 months ago, two years ago now, um, uh, we decided to make some drastic changes in our business. Uh, we decided to uh, formally close our, our broadcast center um, and integrate all of our media production and production management into other parts of our business, and we outsourced our master control. So we decided to focus more on content creation uh, than sort of traditional uh, broadcast television and uh, so that meant that we had to break all of our existing workflows uh, and we needed to reevaluate our archiving solution and really our our MAM at that time um, so the phase two was kicked off um, and we wanted to take sort of our MAM now to that next level so uh, so again we needed to deal with baseband ingest um, as we had no longer a master control to rely on uh, we needed to have direct integration for all of our uh, productions and editing, so we did want to have fully integrated MAM into our edit environment. Um, we needed to be able to support uh, file format delivery to multiple destinations, multiple codecs, um, but we still wanted to maintain a, a mezzanine codec or a, a small number of mezzanine codecs so that uh, we could ensure consistency for editing and for partial restore and restore as we move forwards. Uh, and yeah, we carry on. But. So um, just as, we're, as we transition into this slide, I'll take a sec and we'll come back to this at the end. But another thing that was happening over all that time was we were building up a MAM team. Um, so Rebecca had a group of people working for her. We had a variety of, of staff and they were all learning how to, how to use the MAM, the, the actual tool that we had and building up a, a skill set so that when we went to do this next phase of the project, they knew how things operated. They could speak the language back to our vendor, uh, and they could also um, figure out what we needed to do to, to break through barriers when we were implementing. So um, integrated ingest and delivery. Um, so yeah, the, um, the outsourcing mass control was a real um, game changer for us. It really, it opened up a lot of opportunities, uh, but it was a, a pretty big shift uh, for the organization. Uh, MCR for us was a lot more than what you probably think of when you, you think of that. Uh, they took on a lot of responsibility. So outsourcing that was going to be a big change. Uh, and we saw the opportunity to, to leverage the, the Dillette system uh, to take, take on that and to become a bit more of a production record is the way we refer to it now. Uh, so we developed uh, uh, workflows with uh, both our MCR and with our, um, our other player or, or groups to, to automate the workflow as much as possible. Um, we've got, um, sorry, I'm just catching myself here. Um, and then uh, file-based, yeah, so then we also worked on um, stepping up the file-based delivery of uh, shoot footage. So it had been very folder-based, um, it's actually still ongoing at this point, but we're, we're getting direct uh, ingest into our MAM, so no intermediary steps, no going through edit suites, which has been a big change for us. Uh, so to just you know, further on that, so again, as we heard in the, you know, the previous presentation, the talking about you know, real-based, uh, real-time ingest. Uh, so that is critical for us. Now we, not only do we, do we need to have real-time ingest directly into our MAM, we do real-time editing on those growing files. 
uh, and they both have to you know sustain things like closed captioning um, all the way through so um, embedded audio multiple embedded, embedded audio tracks uh, so again these are all our requirements as we as we move forward um, so that was part of our requirement in phase two as we expanded so right now we're doing uh, eight channels of real-time record um, that allows us to access any one of those records in real time bring that right into our editing environment and so that the editors can be working on it um, really with the end goal of having a very short turnaround time that was one of our, our big things in sports is, is uh, relevance of sports is really in the moment. And any time production takes too long, we sort of slowly lose that relevance every time that the hour passes. Um, so being able to turn around really quickly. Uh, the other big thing was, is of course, now we had to deal with an, a master control that was no longer in our facility. So again, we had to establish a workflow for not only delivering content to that, that master control, but also having content returned uh, from the master control for any uh, on-air programming that they recorded or live uh, content that they recorded. Um, so again, we you know worked with uh, with our BAM uh, and with our outsourced master control, and we built a dedicated one gig link uh, between those facilities with fully automated on both ends for content delivery. So once production is done and it's uh, the 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 uh, final show has been reviewed and QC'd. It's just dropped in a folder and it's loaded right into the master control environment. The automation is done all the way through uh, and the same on the return. So if master control has finished a, uh, a show, that file is closed out, it's dropped into a folder and it's pulled right back all the way right into our MAM. So it, it, there's, no, there's no manual intervention, there's nobody moving, you know, transcoding, clicking, everything is done, um, you know, very seamlessly. Uh, and, and again, that was really a big hurdle for us, having lost control of our own master control and now having to deal with someone else's environment, uh, you know, other t security protocols, IT protocols, um, lots of challenges there, but uh, we're quite happy with the result at the end of the day. Yeah, so the other, uh, one of the, the other big um, uh, wins we went for was a single edit platform. So I hinted at earlier, but we, prior to the, the project, had multiple edit platforms that we were constantly trying to um, share between, uh, same with our production tier. There was a main one, but then there were a whole bunch of other places, or sneaker net, as our IT department like to call it. Um, so the, the, the first choice that we made was to consolidate on a single vendor um, that was in alignment with the motion and design studios um, so that we could have all one, um, one happy family with our studios. Um, it gave us that file interoperability um, that helps a lot, especially considering how integrated those studios want to be anyway. Um, it simplified the technical support for our, our both the MAM team and the, uh, the IT group. And it, um, the sort of the one, well, one, the, the, major, the major hurdle that we had to overcome was training a bunch of editors who had been working on a system for quite some time, thought it was the bee's knees and why would we bother changing that? Um, so there was a little bit of resistance, but not, it wasn't over the top. It was just, it took time and it was something that uh, we needed to do right at the launch of the season, which was a bit of a, a chore. So you want to plan ahead with that and, you know, change management, whenever you talk to a project manager, that's going to be one of the big things that you have to deal with. So that was the main <coughs> one there. Uh, to, to just uh, again, further add, uh, and then go back down into a sort of our day to day is, um, Sports relies on a lot of historical footage. Um, we are constantly referencing archive footage and age footage. Um, very rarely would we have a project that is edited in sort of a self-contained environment or box. Um, so a lot, unlike a lot of other, you know, television or, or film where you're sort of working on one project, once that project is closed, it more or less just goes onto the shelf and it's done. Um, our projects are always evolving. And what we did yesterday, we're going to edit tomorrow because there was a player traded or, you know, we, we want to look back at what happened 20 years ago, 100 years ago. So we're constantly juggling our timelines. So having that really tight integration with our MAM for access to archive footage was really important. Um, so the, again, we, you know, working with our, our MAM supplier, um, uh, and as Michael said, we consolidate on a single production platform. Uh, we now have uh, nine edit suites. 
that are directly integrated into our, our MAM. Um, that allows that editors can start and stop a project in any one of our suites. Uh, they have direct access to view all content in our MAM inside their edit suite. So there's no longer, oh, I'm looking for a shot. Can you find an assistant producer to go into a screening room? Uh, they can screen all their content. Um, and they can do partial restore. So they have no need to restore the entire uh, video. They can do a partial restore and they can start editing on it immediately because they can start editing on the proxy that is always available on the system. So the moment they find the clip, they can start working with that proxy and while the partial restore is happening in the background and that partial restore time takes a various amounts of times depending on how deep the archive is for that, that, that footage. Um, I'll let you speak to the codex and transcoders. Yeah, that's yeah, no. Uh, so again, one of the things that you know we we made a very you know strong choice on was we did not want to support a ton of codex. Um, that's that was definitely a, an uphill battle for us with our production teams and uh, you know and as Michael mentioned earlier, um, there are a lot of great videographers out there and camera operators and we we rely on a lot of freelance. Uh, you know, production crews, and everybody's got a different camera, um, and everybody likes their camera for one reason or another, but as an organization, we had to make a decision to say, uh, we're going to put our foot down, and unfortunately, you know, as the end customer, if you want to work for us, you have to be able to deliver in the file we want. We're no longer going to be pushed around by the people that we hire. Um, we didn't necessarily win a lot of friends by saying that kind of language, but um, really at the end of the day, who would go out and hire someone to come in and you know, renovate your kitchen and be like, well, we're just gonna do what we like best. No, you're, you're paying the bills. So, uh, so that was a, a difficulty, but um, we did wanna make sure we made some concessions. So uh, as we mentioned earlier, we really had two basic codecs in our start, which was XDCAM 50, and um, our second was uh, DVC Pro 100. Um, and uh, as part of our expanding production where we were doing a lot more uh, long form documentary, uh, we started to see the need for uh, the 24P codec. Um, so at that time, uh, Keep going. no worries, we introduced uh, a XAVC codec, uh, XAVC 100 at uh, 24P. Um, Magic fingers. Yeah. Just, just, the Fonzarelli, excellent. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so again, we, we started to support more contacts. But at the end of the day, we also acknowledge that uh, as much as we want to only support one or two or three or four mezzanine codecs, uh, we have to be able to you know, acknowledge that there's a lot of delivery codecs that we have to meet, both our own internal. So again, as I mentioned, not only our linear networks, now our linear networks do work on our mezzanine format, uh, but you know, we have things like digital signage, scoreboards um, that have a variety of uh, you know, matrox iframe codecs or you know, various uh, uncompressed dot move or uncompressed AVIs. Um, so you know, the ability to, be able to transcode as well as um, you know, we do still sometimes have to bring in content from uh, third parties and uh, you know, we, uh, you know, leverage those trend coders to make sure that, uh, you know, we're meeting them. Um, so right now we have four nodes that are pretty much running 24-7, constantly addressing any of our needs. Um, all of those workflows are automated, again, generally speaking, so um, the, the, the system is really designed for the end user. Um, so whether it's a camera operator or producer or uh, whoever's working on the system, uh, really all they're doing is loading their content, dragging it into a folder, and the, the system will validate what the current codec is, whether it meets our mezzanine standard or not, and then if it, if it doesn't meet, it will kick it off and send it through a transcoding process. If it does meet our standards, it will, uh, it will just transfer the files directly into our, our MAM. So where are we today a little bit on technical specifications? So, uh, as I mentioned, the three main codecs we're supporting, XDCAM50, DVC Pro 100, and XAVC 100, uh, we're down to 150 terabytes of usable storage or online storage, uh, which is actually a reduction, which is an important note. Uh, as spinning disk, while it gets cheaper, uh, it's still not that cheap. Uh, and when you're looking at large volumes of it, um, again, it still becomes quite costly, so of course we want to move as much as we possibly can and as quickly as we can to LTO. 
um, as it uh, saves us so much money. Um, so, you know, again, we're now down to, we've, we've standardized right now on LTO5, uh, and we're having 400 active slots and 2,000 vaulted slots that are inside of our, our MAM. Um, again, 15 web clients, nine video edit suites, one audio suite. We're doing eight band, uh, baseband ingests and two baseband playout ports and the two transcoders with two nodes each. Um, the other thing that uh, I'll, I'll mention that we sort of, um, uh, as part of our sort of phase two, um, was uh, direct playout, ingest, or playout integration into our MAM. Uh, so this is actually just over this past summer. Um, part of our expansion process was to integrate our in-arena presentation um, into our MAM um, because, again, we had, you know, traditional clip servers that you would find from the, you know, many manufacturers in the broadcast industry uh, that we were using for many years and had lots of success. But, again, they came with their own codec requirements and they came with uh, a file-based transfer that we needed to execute. So. Uh, 84 games a year, you know, either sort of an FTP transfer or a hard drive or something like that, and waiting a long time for uh, files to be transcoded or ingested into the, the clip server. Um, so this past summer we did a full integration, so our playout now comes directly um, from our, our MAM. Uh, so there's no need for file transfer anymore for playout. Uh, those files can be played directly off the SAS. So uh, again, there's, there's no movement of files anymore. Uh, the editor, again, as soon as they start to render that file, um, 20 seconds or so, just enough to buffer the file to get it sort of grounded, and uh, then we can start playing that back out. So, um, again, a huge time saver for us. Um, and really, that's been our whole uh, process um, and you know, much of our philosophy um, through this project is really how do we do more with less? How do we do it faster? How do we do it easier? How do we, you know, eliminate how many hands or humans have to touch it? Um, we, not that we're, we've actually reduced the number of people because there's also a lot of administrative tasks that have to go along with a MAM um, and having that much footage available and keeping it, you know, controlled and organized because again, once it gets unorganized, um, you're, in a, you're in a really bad spot really quickly. Um, Michael, do you want to jump in? And Sure. Uh, I'll just run down really quickly the takeaways and then we can move on to the question and answer phase. Um, so having a larger vision, that's really important. Um, you, you need to, to know where you're trying to get to, so mega master, but you might not get there all at once, so be ready to, to break it up into a manageable phase. Uh, executive buy-in is huge. This is extremely expensive, uh, this proposition, so you're going to need to have uh, an executive team that understands that it's not only just one-time purchase, it's also an ongoing purchase, so this is a, a, a serious investment in your media strategy. Uh, you need to ensure that you have buy-in from all your impacted departments, so you can give them the nicest tools in the world, it's gonna change the way they work, so they're gonna be maybe not necessarily on board right away. You need to, to find a way to, to pitch the, the, um, the MAM in such a way that they see the value that they're gonna get and not the, oh God, I gotta do all this extra work now to, to do what I've always done. Um, invest in a team of media managers, that's a selfish one, but uh, it's important. This is, it doesn't take care of itself. Uh, even if you've got automated um, uh, description and automated purging, you need people to manage that. Um, and there's going to be the exception case and there's going to be the problems. And also uh, building up a, a team of in-house talent who understand both the product, but then also how you're using the product are going to be invaluable for you as you move into your, your future phases. Uh, having a clear understanding of the workflows you need to, to support and to define technical requirements involved. So again, the, the tools will do kind of anything. Um, what you get out of them is what you're able to put into them at the start. So being able to describe really clear, clearly to your vendor uh, what are you trying to achieve. Uh, both from a, like a pushing buttons and making things flow, but then also what are your, what are your requirements in terms of what's your environment? Um, what are your security requirements on your side? What do they need access to? Um, these are all sort of pitfalls that might come at you as you get deeper into it. So try and get that out on the table as early as possible. Uh, do a volume analysis. So again, really expensive. Um, the storage is really expensive. The products are really expensive. Uh, so understanding what you actually need versus what 
you know you think maybe you should buy is a really important thing. So take a look at what you're what you're producing, what the what the size is going to be, how it's going to change day over day, and then also thinking in terms of when I've got a purge cycle in there, is it actually going to keep growing the way I think it does now? Because it's not necessarily apples to apples in that scenario. Uh, and then build plenty of slack in your project timeline. That's true of pretty much every project uh, management situation I've ever been in. You've got the best of plans. You might have a really good looking plan, but you're going to run into pitfalls that you just can't, can't foresee, and you have to be able to, to roll with that. So um, we, we were lucky in that we had a lot of support going into this, and we had a strong team who could help pull us through. But you're going you're gonna to run into challenges, and so it's good to have set expectations and, and be able to, to work that way. And just to add, um, you know, when I, when I look at our project and, and where we've come from and where we've sort of gotten to, um, again, we, don't, we didn't go out and buy a new piece of hardware. We didn't go out and assemble a bunch of hardware uh, that came together. Uh, I mean, really, the solution involves, you know, pretty standard PCs, uh, you know, storage arrays, LTO. Like, there's nothing, even ingest, again, I mean, you know, an, baseband ingest and in I.O. is not difficult to come by and it's you know there's a plethora of, of vendors out there um, but it's really understanding that life cycle of that file and um, I think having you know from when we look back for me key learnings is really delineating where that file needs to start and end in its journey and you may not be able to get there in day one but that's okay just know where you need to cut it off in day one and then as you know as we did uh, we just kept adding on and again because it's not a very fixed environment that's very defined. Um, you know, there's not a fixed I.O. It's not a router. It's, uh, you can just keep adding on, layering on year after year after year. There's no, uh, that's the, I think the other maybe pitfall of MAM and, and, and I think people like to think of MAM as, well, I'm gonna do it for a year and then it's gonna be done and then it will do its thing and you know, we'll move on to our next project. It will never die. You will be suffering with it for every day that you, I like to say suffering. Loving it. It's, good. it's the best experience <laughs> yeah. ever. But uh, yeah, no, it, it is the gift that right. keeps on giving. And uh, um, but uh, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, as we move more and more into the digital workflow, uh, you know, again, our, you know, our plans are to, you know, eventually move our organization into an IP based. So again, we'll start to look at, you know, doing baseband or sorry, IP based ingest. So just again, layering on the, the elements as they come at us. All right, thank you everyone. Uh,